This meeting is being recorded. Go. Good morning. My name is Charles Francis McAfee. Born in 1932, December 25th. If I'm lucky, I'll make my 90th birthday this December 25th. I was born in Los Angeles, California. During the middle of the depression, my mom and dad were looking for work. So they went to California where her mother lived. And that's where I was born, but I was only there six months. We came back to Wichita. So I've been in Wichita all of my life. I grew up at 933 Indiana, right across the street from Dunbar Elementary School where I went to elementary school through the sixth grade segregated elementary school and then to Leoverture to the seventh and eighth grade segregated again. And then first time integrated school was to Central Intermediate. We didn't have an indoor gym. We didn't have facilities that the other schools had. So the first place we really played indoors was in the ninth grade. Uh, I played for her basketball for St. Peter Claver, a Catholic school that was open two blocks north of my house. They didn't have enough students, so they let us recruit from the neighborhood. It must have been the first great illegal recruiting because all the guys they recruited ended up making all state in high school and then one of them all American in college. But that was just the beginning. I was pretty good at tennis, couldn't play in high school. I was very good at drafting. My first drafting instructor was a man by the name of John Carter, who taught me how to draw things with a T-square and a triangle. When I got to high school, I finished the whole year's work in the first semester. So my instructor hired me out to home builders. So I was making $10 a house uh, drawing that I did for construction. Thought I was really making some serious money. But with all the racism that was going on, my mom and dad thought I needed to get out of Wichita. So they were looking for a school up north, so to speak. Found the University of Nebraska. Well, my brother drove me up to Nebraska, dropped me off. So, so freshman, uh, freshman uh, a week, I was looking for some other colored people, didn't find any. <laughs> Went to play tennis, nobody would play. Came back by the gym and heard of basketball. So I went inside and I was standing there. Two guys were playing two guys and the third guy, a fifth guy showed up. They said, you play basketball? I said, yeah. Well, come on. So I started playing basketball with these guys. I didn't know who they were. There was a guy up in the stands looking. So he came down about a half hour and he says, you go to school here? And I said, uh, yeah. He said, are you coming out for the basketball team? I said, no. He said, I'd like for you to come out for the basketball team. I said, who are you? My name is Harry Good. And I'm the basketball coach here at the University of Nebraska. So I promised my mother and father no sports because my freshman year I had calculus, chemistry, and physics. And I had 18 hours. So I promised them no sports but I didn't tell them. I went out for the basketball team and I made it. And freshmen couldn't play varsity. So I came home for Christmas. My father who watched two television for everything on sports and read Sports Illustrated. And he was sitting in his easy chair when I walked in the house. He says, uh, who is this? outstanding freshman guard 
on the basketball team at the University of Nebraska named Charles McAfee. I said, well, Daddy, look, uh, I was going to tell you and Mama they're going to help with a scholarship that'll save you some money. He said, that wasn't a deal. The deal was, we pay the bills, you study. I said, well, now, if you tell Mama, he said, I'm not telling your mother. You, your mother's back there in the kitchen. So I went back in the kitchen. My mom was about 5'2". And I'm standing there looking down at her. She's got her hands in the dishwasher. And I'm telling her this story. She looks at me real slowly up and looks me in the face. And I thought I was getting ready to hear the words like, go out in that backyard, cut the biggest switch you can find and bring it back in here to me. <laughs> but she didn't. So they let me go ahead and play. But this was during the Korean War. So I get drafted in the middle of the second semester in 1953. And I was in the army, March the 6th. They sent me to a segregated camp in Missouri. We got on buses and they were shipping us to uh, Camp Polk, Louisiana. We got to uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. There were only about seven or eight black guys out of about five buses. And uh, the sergeant, big white guy, came by and said, Soldier, follow me. I said, Where are we going? He said, Follow me. So I followed him, and the rest of us followed him. Looked up in the sign and said, Colored waiting room. And uh, I thought, Why are we going in the colored waiting room? And so he, uh, we went in there, and the black people were sitting around the wall. They had this big long table in the middle of the room where they were going to feed the black draftees with all the white guys were out in the dining room. <laughs> I picked up the plate and turned it over and smashed it on the table. By the time we got to Camp Polk, Louisiana, it was like one o'clock in the morning, I was about to starve to death. At Camp Polk, I became the top draftee of my class in weaponry and everything else. I led the guide on. Uh, I went over to play tennis, and these guys tried to recruit me for the tennis team. They were all colonels and majors, and uh, they did. And uh, then they also, somebody was going to put me in for officer's candidate school. They left it in the drawer and didn't do it. So they shipped me overseas. They sent half of us to Korea and the other half to Germany. Well, by the time I got to Germany, they sent us out on bivouac at the Russian zone, sleeping on tents on the ground for two weeks. And I came back, went over to the gym. I was playing basketball with a couple of guys over there. This little short major came in and he says, you stationed here? I said, yeah. He said, how would you like to be on a basketball team? We want to start a basketball team. I said, well, I got to go to, back to the field tomorrow morning. He said, if you decide to play basketball, I'll cut your orders. And you don't have to go anywhere. So he cut my orders. And from then on, I was on special services. Special services playing basketball, special services playing tennis. And I traveled the whole European zone. I had had all my architectural history courses. So I went to Rome, I went to Paris, I went to London. And all the places I had studied, all the ancient architectural facilities, like St. Peter's in Rome and, and, and Trafalgar Square in, in London, and all of the rest of those places. So I finally got out. I made the European All-Star team. And we were going to have a military Olympics. And so uh, 
So what happened was there were four teams that were going to play in the military Olympics. And it was going to be in Cairo, Egypt. So they picked 15 of us from all four disciplines and uh, sent us to Nuremberg. So I was at Nuremberg for a month doing nothing but playing basketball and having great food. Well, then uh, we were supposed to go from Nuremberg to uh, Athens for a week and then all over to Cairo. Well, what happened was the Russians decided that they weren't going to participate. So that was the first time I disliked the Russians because <laughs> I didn't get to go to Cairo. So anyway, I get back home and uh, made up my mind if I had to stand on my head. I was going back to Nebraska to major in architecture and graduate. In the meantime, the marvelous lady I was engaged to, who had graduated from Howard University, her name was Gloria Winston, from a very, very famous uh, black family here in Kansas and in Mississippi. Her uncle was the first African-American elected to the school board. And he was uh, the president of the Wichita School Board during Brown versus the Board of Education. Uh, her older uncle and his wife had a newspaper in Canton, Mississippi. Their father, out of slavery, started seven black colleges and universities um, right out of slavery. And they, their newspaper was called the Negro Star. So when they moved to Wichita, they started the Negro Star in Wichita which was published for like 26 years. So anyway, we got married in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I'm in school and working hard. Cheryl was born in Lincoln, Nebraska <laughs> in a hospital the first time they'd ever had a colored baby born in that hospital up north. I refer to Lincoln, Nebraska as up south. But uh, when I got ready to graduate, I was three hours short, which nobody ever told me that I was not graduating on time. So I had to go to summer school. I went to summer school for one semester, took calculus. They said, if you passed all three, exams, you didn't have to take the final. So I didn't have to take the final. We had graduation. I ran and got my diploma and swore I'd never go back to the University of Nebraska. My brother was bringing a car around. My mom and my dad, my sister, everybody was there. My dad walked me over to turn in my cap and gown. My marvelous father, Arthur J. McAfee Sr., put his arm around my shoulder and he said, I have done what I wanted to do in life. And that was to get all three of my children a college education that I never had the opportunity to have. And I looked at him, I said, did I put all that gray hair on the left side of your head or the right side of your head? So we went on back to Wichita. Well, I got home, I had job offers in New York, Boston and Los Angeles, in Los Angeles with the great black architect, Paul Williams. And there was another black guy who had graduated from Kansas State, lived right around the corner from us on Ohio. His mother and my mother sang in the choir, church choir. So he was home from a week vacation. He came around to see me. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm just trying to make up my mind what job I'm going to take. And he said to me, he said, I know you couldn't get a job in Wichita because when I tried to get one, nobody would hire me. 
I hated for anybody to tell me what I couldn't do. So Monday, I put my stuff under my arm and went looking for a job. Went in this one place and this guy says, your stuff is really good. I said, well, I worked in the biggest architectural office in Lincoln, Nebraska for the last two years I was in school. And so I have a lot of practical experience. He said, well, I'm getting ready to go on vacation, but my partner will be back on Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to tell him that I really would wait for his decision to hire you, but I'm in favor of it. So I thought, well, I got a job, so I didn't really need to go back. I didn't have anything to do with Wednesday, so I went back. Uh, this guy looks at me and says the same thing. Boy, your stuff is really good. I said, yeah. He said, I was kind of worried about my partner. So why were you worried about your partner? He said, well, my partner's from Oklahoma. Well, Oklahoma was one of the places where when I made the basketball team and the tennis team, I couldn't play, couldn't eat in the restaurants, couldn't stay in the hotels, and couldn't play in the arenas. So I'm thinking, Oklahoma. I said, well, where are you from? I'm from Texas. Well, Texas was worse than Oklahoma. So I'm going, but they hired me. I went to work there. Then I went to work for another firm, then another firm in three years. You have to work three years before you can take the exam. So I took the exam and I had this one little house. I had a drafting table, five foot wide, T-square and triangles, back in our utility room with the washer and dryer. And this couple hired me to do their house. So I designed this house. I worked all night long. My wife woke up and came in and said, what are you singing? I said, what do you mean, what am I singing? She says, you're singing Design, Charlie, Design. I said, oh, I was? I said, well, I just finished this house. So we got the house built. I submitted it for a design award to the Federal Housing Administration. And the letter came back, said I had won this national honor first place award. Wow. So that's all I got. So I made a phone call. I said, what am I supposed to be doing? I said, you didn't get the rest of the information? I said, no. I said, oh, well, so and so and so and so. Dr. Robert C. Weaver was to become the first African-American in a presidential cabinet. He was the secretary of HUD. So I had to borrow the money from my mom and dad for my wife and I to go, <laughs> to, go to Washington. I'd never been to Washington. We flew into Baltimore. As soon as we got in, landed, there was a public address announcement said, would arriving passenger Charles McAfee please come to a white paging phone? So I went to the phone. It was Dr. Robert Weaver saying, please come to our office first thing in the morning. So we get to the hotel in DC and early the next morning we had breakfast and called and went down. Gloria and I walked in the, in the door. The secretary was sitting there, white lady. She looked up at me and she says, are, 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 are you Mr. McAfee? And I said, yes. The woman jumped up and ran out of the room. Gloria and I are looking at each other. She's got another white woman holding her hand saying, Dr. Weaver is going to be so proud. So now we knew what <laughs> the excitement was about. She said, just go back and you're gonna get your picture taken with a couple of people. One of the other award readers is in getting his picture taken at this moment. So Gloria and I walked back and the door opened and the guy who walks out of the door is I am Pei. He looks at me and he says, are you one of the award winners? And I said, yes. He said, how old are you? I said, 29. He smiled and he said, I remember those days. Well, I am Pei K. 
came from China, graduated from Harvard, and out of Harvard became the architect for the largest developer, a guy named Zickendorf out of New York City. And so he invited Gloria and I to come to New York to visit his office. So we thanked him. And then the next person that they took us into was Dr. Weaver's number one assistant. His number one assistant was the former lead lawyer for Thurgood Marshall when they won the Brown versus the Board of Education. And he was from Richmond, Virginia. So I'm walking in tall cotton the whole, the whole process. And we get to Washington. I got so many interviews. I was in all kinds of architectural magazines all over the country. And that led to me having contracts from Maine to Texas. So I did a lot of housing projects um, for FHA, a lot of planning projects for urban design. And I started winning all kinds of awards, more awards. And I was traveling all over every place. Other two daughters were born and I would come home when I worked for this last firm and I'd be so damn mad. I would be fussing at the dinner table and they would all just be staring at me. And I realized, so Cheryl and her mommy were dropping me off at that office. And Cheryl said to me, Daddy, don't be mean to anybody to, tonight. I got out of the car and I thought, what is she talking about? And then I realized when I got home, I would be so mad and disgusted because of where I was working. I was taking it out on everybody at the family. So I tried to make a promise that at breakfast and at dinner, I would not be talking about business. I'd be talking about family. And then I got another job down in Tulsa with a classmate of mine who had been with me at the University of Nebraska. His father was one of those people that survived the bombing of Tulsa. He was one of the top businessmen in Tulsa. He was a pharmacist and owned a lot of land stuff. Lloyd took over uh, his business and everything and then expanded. And one day I flew down to Tulsa to look at the project. He said, you're going to stay tonight? I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm going to take you to a club. He said, I now represent a bunch of entertainers. And I got a couple that I've signed up to perform here in this little club here. And so we got this little club. The smoke was about three foot off the floor. And the couple was outstanding. I mean, outstanding. I'd never heard anything like it. So when it got to the intermission, the announcer said, let's have a big hand for Ike and Tina Turner. And I said, who is that? <laughs> so my life continues to be exposed to these kinds of things. Well, I went to uh, Atlanta for the American Institute of Architects National Convention. And uh, my brother, who couldn't get a job in Kansas, but had three Kansas college degrees, uh, wanted to be a basketball coach. Well, my brother coached high school in Florida for a couple of years and then four black colleges, one a year, and ended up at Morehouse College. So my brother was at the famous Morehouse College. Well, I was walking and a guy walks up to me and says, are you an architect? I got my ribbons on, so I'm an architect. And I said, yeah, I'm an architect. He said, well, we're gonna build a subway system here in Atlanta. And we've been told by Dr. Lowry, Dr. King's assistant at that time, that we better hire black architects. Well, there were only about four or five of us there. 
So he had a meeting around two o'clock and there were two black women sitting on either side of him. They were his assistants. And this guy was the engineering firm who was the lead firm for the Metropolitan Atlanta Rapid Transit Authority. Incidentally, black people in Atlanta said those initials meant moving African-Americans rapidly through Atlanta. <laughs> but anyway, so he starts talking about everything and then gets up and leaves. Well, both of these ladies, one of them looks at me and she says, where are you from? I said, Wichita, Kansas. She said, I'm from Emporia. I said, you're from Emporia? Yeah. She said, I went to Emporia State. I said, well, my brother's at Morehouse. That's your brother at Morehouse? I said, yeah. She said, let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to go back to Wichita and write a letter, tell them you want to come and do a presentation on these new projects that are coming out for rapid rail stations. So I did. They invited me down. I went down because these two ladies said, we're going to get you a job. We're going to get you a job. So I made a presentation. There was a $20 million presentation, for one station, and a $35 million for them. I went for the 35, got the 35, designed it, opened my office in Atlanta. And another one of the things that had happened to me before this was there were a group of guys from Kansas that we referred to as the Kansas Black Mafia. Art Fletcher from Junction City, Ed Sexton from Wichita, Kansas, Seth Jackson from Topeka, Kansas, out of the firm Brown versus the Board of Education, Topeka, Sam Cornelius from Indiana. These guys all got high appointments during the Nixon administration. They would pick up the phone and call me and tell me to do this, do that, and I'd hop on a plane. I've done rural studies for small black communities, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, and Oklahoma. So I did a lot of those. Got them a lot of grant money for improving their towns. So then we start doing a lot of other things. In the meantime, Cheryl graduates from Kansas State and gets accepted both at MIT and Harvard. And she said, I guess I'll go to, Har to MIT. I said, you don't look happy. Well, MIT offered me an $8,000 scholarship. Harvard didn't offer us anything. So my wife and I went down and talked to my mama. My father had passed by now. And, and uh, what happened was, was we were talking to mama. My mother was doing all my bookkeeping for me, all of it. And so, Mama looked up at us and says, if we have to go to the poorhouse, the baby's going to Harvard. <laughs> That's how the decision finally got made. She all graduated from Harvard with honors. And we all went up for a graduation that was outstanding. And she eventually came to Wichita and started working here. By now, I have offices in Wichita, Kansas City, and Atlanta. And I'm leaving Wichita on Monday or Tuesday. I go to Kansas City, then I go to Atlanta. I generally get back about by Friday. So that was the way my schedule was. And we kept on winning design awards. One year, they gave out six design awards for the state of Kansas. We won three of the six. So professionally, we've done a lot of stuff. But along the way, my marvelous wife became a school principal. And she also ended up a diabetic. 
And one day they called us in and said, uh, Gloria, we've been looking for a cadaver match, but we haven't found one. And we think a live donor is what we need to do. And your three daughters would probably be the best beat me the test. And I looked at him, I said, and Gloria said, no, I don't want that. I said, don't worry. I said, when we got married, we knew we were the same blood type and didn't mean anything. But now I've read everything about this and it means everything. We're the same blood type, so I'll do it. So they tested all of us, everybody matched enough so I still was the one blessed to be able to wear one of my kidneys, which I did. And it lasted almost 19 years. And uh, we were all blessed to have her around that long and wish she was still here. But the image of my mother and father, her mother and father, those people that came before us, that set the stage for who we are is so very important. And that's the history of black people. It's who paved the way for you. And right now we continue to do that because our grandchildren, <laughs> they kept moving up to bigger cities. All three of them are in New York City. <laughs> the youngest grand granddaughter when she graduated from high school, she graduated from the Dallas High School for the Performing Arts and uh, majored in classical dance. And when I was driving her somewhere, I said, Sydney, where are you gonna go to school? She said, well, Grandpa, there are only four colleges that won't give me the same degree I want. I said, what degree? I knew classical dance was supposed to be one of them. And she said, astrophysics. I didn't even know what astrophysics was. So I thought I'd wait till I got home and read on what astrophysics was. So then she told me, University of Utah. Said, oh, God, I don't want her going out there. But she went anyway with her dual degrees. The Salt Lake City newspaper wrote, a full page story about no other woman, black or white, has accomplished what Sydney Duncan has accomplished with her grade point average and all of her success. We would go out for her dance programs and she would be the lead dancer or choreographer. And so she's in New York My grandson is in New York after he gets a master's in advertising and works for a major international firm. Cheryl's daughter is now at CBS, New York City. So everybody's moved on up. <laughs> I'm still a few years later my wife and I were trying to figure out how we were going to transfer the firm to the two daughters that are architects. Well, the daughter, who's probably the smartest of all of us, graduated from University of Kansas and got a master's from Texas. And now just recently got a PhD or an EDD from uh, uh, Creighton University in the middle of the virus. Uh, but I couldn't transfer ownership because she wasn't an architect. But woke up one morning and I said, I got it. And Gloria said, what? I said, uh, we've worked for them all of our lives. And I've gone to these classes about how to sell the firm to people, whatever. I said, but I can sell it to them. So we decided we would just give 
Cheryl and Charles, my youngest daughter, who is now operating the Dallas office, and Cheryl's operating the Atlanta office. We gave them the ownership of the architectural firm. So now I work for them when they let me. <laughs> but uh, it's been a marvelous life. I've met so many important people along the way. Uh, partner of mine in Richmond, Virginia, whose father built the first black hotel and restaurant in Richmond. He called me one day and he said, uh, I've been trying to get some tickets. Billy Eckstein and Nancy Wilson are performing at the Fox Theater and they're sold out. I said, don't worry. Well, I had been appointed by Nixon um, first Minority Development Board. Nancy Wilson was one of those, Desi Arnaz, Don Newcomb, and a bunch of other people. So I called Nancy, told Nancy. She said, Charlie, don't, how many tickets you need? I said, just a couple. She said, I'll leave them at my hotel. I said, what hotel are you staying at? She said, at the Marriott. I said, that's the same place I stay. It's just a block from the theater. So we went. Performance was outstanding. So after the performance was over, Eggleston, my partner, and I sat in the lobby of the Marriott Hotel till 2 a.m. in the morning talking to Nancy and, and, and Billy Eckstein and Eckstein talking about how he loved to come to Richmond, Virginia and have some sugar cured ham at Eggleston's restaurant. That grandson now owns and operates four or five restaurants in Virginia called Coker's Spot and have won the national award for one of the top restaurants in the country. And so if you're ever in Richmond, Virginia, go to Coker's Spot. Andy Young, we did Andy Young's personal residence in Atlanta. Cheryl has since put an addition on the restaurant. I mean, the restaurant. Residents, Cheryl has since put an addition on that uh, residence. But there would be times when I would be in Andy's house, and President Carter would drive up and pick him up. They'd fly off to Japan or someplace. So it was always an interesting kind of a that I involved in. I got a job down in Miami. And I came back to do another subway type station. They're not subways in Miami because water's three feet below ground, so they had to be above grade. But I came back to Wichita. I was sitting in my office, the phone rang. And this woman said, Mr. McAfee? I said, yes, ma'am. My name is Athelie Range. And I I'm on the county commission in Miami. Yes, ma'am. Well, for the next half hour, all I said was, yes, ma'am. Because I realized who this woman was. She owned the largest mortuary in Florida. Buried people all the way down in the Caribbean. So when time came for me to negotiate my contract, she asked me if I could, she could come. I said, of course. I wasn't going to tell her no. So we're all sitting around the conference table ready to negotiate little tap at the door. She opened the door and came in and introduced herself. My name is Athely Range. <laughs> Everybody just looked at her. So it was the smoothest negotiation I've ever been in. Nobody said anything to everything I wanted. She said, Charles, are you satisfied now? I said, yes, ma'am. Well, I'll be going on. She got up and walked out. The chief of, of the Metro system asked me to come to his office. I went to his office, said, Mr. McAfee said, if you ever have a problem, don't call Miss Range. Just tell me what the problem is. <laughs> Those are the kinds of supports that I had from various people. When we got the Olympic contract, Atlanta, 
and he was the chairman of the board of the Atlanta Olympic Games. Our firm got selected with the joint venture, so we were the prime architect of the joint venture that can, uh, included a program management firm out of New York, a construction company out of Tennessee, I believe, and us as the architect. And I came home and I told Cheryl, I said, baby, we got the Olympics. Cheryl said, daddy, I'm out of here. <laughs> she moved to Atlanta, she became the principal architect and did just a tremendous job of being the chief architect for 32 venues and a billion dollars worth of work in Atlanta for the Olympic games. So those are just some of the really kind of exciting things that I've done in my lifetime. But given my wife, that kid elevates itself above all the rest. Do you have any questions you want to ask? 